makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Bitcoin steadies after a fake post saying the SEC had approved ETFs of the digital asset, while an actual decision is expected later today. Houthi rebels carry out one of their largest drone and missile attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea, prompting action from U.S. and U.K. warships in the critical sea route. Plus, sales at the world's largest chip manufacturer, TC, TSMC, fell 8% in December, but revenue for the quarter was actually a beat. Now, also coming up, exclusive interviews with the chief executives of one of India's biggest tech companies, Tech Mahindra, and of South Africa's most valuable listed company, Naspers. So all of that is coming up. We also have a great interview looking at the global risk report by the World Economic Forum. Now, let's also take a look at the European markets map. It's very clear when you look at the last 12 to 18 hours um, that we're seeing a bit of a risk of well, risk off mood in, in a lot of these markets. Japanese stocks, so for example, climbing to fresh highs. I think they're at three decades highs. Again, that really uh, contrasts with muted trading across the rest of the equity world. As you can see, I think the CAC 40 is pretty much unchanged. The UK is a little bit in the red. Again, there's broader sentiment um, that seems very cautious ahead of that key US inflation report. And that will probably change the dynamic or not in the markets. Now, to talk about these markets, to talk also about Bitcoin ETFs, we're joined by Justina Lee and our senior editor on crypto, Anna Herrera. So thank you both for joining us. First of all, Justina, just to get it out of the way, I mean, it's all about inflation. Yeah. And it's still about inflation. And so the markets are a little bit in a wait and see situation for the moment, I guess. Right, exactly. I mean, we've kind of seen this tussle between bond market kind of traders, which seem a lot more hopeful about how many rate cuts we're going to get this year. And at the same time, we've had kind of Fed officials pushing back against that narrative, saying that, you know, they, they kind of see uh, policy as appropriately restrictive mm -hmm. for now. And I think the inflation data this week is going to be really important seeing kind of like you know, whether we're still kind of on track for cooling inflation and whether it might even like undershoot expectations, yeah. because that would point to like the lagged effects from monetary tightening coming yeah. through. But just, you know, overall, and I know you, you've been on, on TV kind of trying to explain what we saw at the end of last year, which was a real dichotomy between what we're seeing in the real economy in terms of data and what the market we're pricing in. Are you expecting it to, to kind of track a little bit more this year? Yeah, I think that really is a great question. I mean, what the stock market is telling us is sort of different from the bond market is in that it's really sort of basking in the glow of this kind of like go to law scenario. And I think what the stock market really needs is kind of like is more closer to the Fed scenario, which is that inflation coming down enough, but economic growth not slowing so much that we're going to get like, I don't know, one percentage point of rate cuts or something. And today the, the focus is firmly on the, these Bitcoin ETFs. And I haven't really seen anything like it. So yesterday... We, you know, we were kind of expecting news from the SEC this week to see whether there's approval for an ETF on Bitcoin. Yesterday there was a tweet, but it was actually a false tweet. So they hacked. Someone managed to hack into the SEC uh, X account and saying it was approved when it wasn't. Yes, which is even for crypto standards quite insane. Um, and it turns out X is saying that the SEC didn't have two-factor authentication, which is a pretty standard. <laughs> Uh, way to protect your accounts uh, and it's it, it, obviously the irony wasn't lost on crypto folks who have been you know uh, under pressure from regulators and criticized for not having strong cybersecurity controls and now you know they, they get this hack on the other side so it was quite interesting and it but it did show what the reaction might be if an yeah. SEC gets approved and we saw Bitcoin fall quite quickly yeah. and other crypto assets so maybe it is priced in I mean, it's quite interesting that you're still able to manipulate, like, n not manipulate, but because we don't know if that's what happened, but you're able to move prices with, with tweets and just hack into the SEC's account. Yeah, it's funny. So that's what I thought. I was like, wow, it's still very relevant, actually, because Bitcoin did move quite a lot. Were we expecting it to go down? So again, I mean, th this was a hack, so we don't know if it's approved, but would it have been surprising that Bitcoin fell on the back of approval of ETFs? I, I think so. People are more expecting it to shoot up. Um, we had a similar incident where people thought um, that the, they had been approved and the price shot up. So, but it has been going up and down a lot since the start of the year, so maybe it is priced in. We'll see now what the reaction will be, because obviously now it's 
it's happened already, so people know what the rea it's very it's very messed up, I guess. It is very messed up. What happens to actually these kind of you know Bitcoin um, or just in this world as an asset class in 2024? I think like 2023 destroyed a lot of credibility for it. Is this the year where they build it back up? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because currently, you know, we're all expecting the SEC to, you know, approve some of the ETFs based on the court decision earlier. So that would mean suddenly there is a way easier uh, kind of way to just invest in Bitcoin and you don't have to worry about, you know, FTX or Binance. But in a way, it's kind of ironic, right, because crypto was always about inventing a new way of doing things. But if everyone's just going to plow their money into the Bitcoin ETF, then that's kind of a different narrative there. But and if they approve it, I mean, it's a big deal because are, are they basically saying that they now think that Bitcoin is, is less likely to be used for, for, you know, deviating funds and for money laundering. So I think a lot of the concerns they had originally was that the price, you couldn't really rely on the right. price and it was a little bit manipulated. So I, I guess it means that the, those concerns have been sort of laid to rest a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so it does show that the asset has matured enough that people right. are willing to, or regulators are willing to let mass investors get into the crypto. But obviously it, it won't completely be deviated from like the crypto infrastructure because yeah. you still need to buy underlying Bitcoin and store them with someone and that custodian for now is Coinbase. So, you know, it is still tied to crypto really. It's not completely detached. But would the SEC do due diligence, for example, on, on money laundering? No, it's not really what they do if they approve the ETF. No, I think it, it, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit separate. That, that would be another, another issue. Um, and uh, Justina, do, do, do we know if a lot of, again, it changes the positioning of big asset managers? We heard from Larry Fink of BlackRock on, on Bitcoin ETF, but does it, if it does get approved, and I don't know, what the, what's the likelihood of it getting approved? Are we like 80% there? I, I, I don't know. Everybody, it depends every day. I think that there was one of the issuers yesterday who said we're pretty sure we'll get approved, which also led to people quite, you know, Believing reacting. Between. Yeah. But does it mean so that more asset managers, big asset managers will take positions or, uh, on, on Bitcoin ETFs or is it still quite small? I mean, I think so. I kind of in the sense that a lot of what's always stopped them is the having to navigate the infrastructure of crypto. Yeah. And suddenly there is a product out there that they're very familiar with. And yeah. so I think now they're going to see it as kind of, you know, any other ETF. And so if they kind of want to take a position, they can easily take a position. Of course, our obsession is still with the bond rally. <laughs> How much time are you spending looking at what bonds are doing in this kind of environment? Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of definitely still a big one. I mean, are we really going to get that much rate cuts? And I think, you know, it's interesting because right now with kind of real interest rate where it is, you could get some rate cuts without it becoming kind of full on easing. But at this point, has the band, has the bond rally already priced in, you know, many more rate cuts than the Fed is projecting itself? I think that's sort of the big question here. Thank you so much, Justina and Anna, Justina Lee and Anna Herrera, of course, on all asset classes, but a lot of focus on this possible Bitcoin uh, ETF approval. Now, let's also bring you an update on the big corporate story of the past few days. This, of course, Boeing and the chief executive, Dave Calhoun, has says the plane maker must own up to its mistake after a dramatic mid-air fuselage blowout forced the grounding of some of its planes. Now, Calhoun had called an all-hands meeting with employees to reinforce safety as Boeing's top priority. We're going to approach this, number one, acknowledging our mistake. We are going to approach it with 100% and complete transparency every step of the way. We're going to work with the NTSB, who is investigating the accident itself to find out what the root cause is. I have a long experience with this group. They're as good as it gets. Now, coming up, can India's tech sector continue to outperform? We'll be joined by the chief executive of Tech Mahindra. That's coming up shortly. And this is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, Indian tech stocks enjoyed a rally at the end of last year with the Nifty IT index up some 12 percent since the end of October, outperforming the Nifty 50. Analysts have though sounded a note of caution ahead of earnings due out this week and next. Well, with me now is Mohit Joshi. He's managing director and chief executive of one of India's biggest tech firms, 
Tech Mahindra. Thank you, sir, for joining us. I know we always have an interview to look after Davos or, or before Davos, and yes. this year it's going to be a, a pretty big one with a lot of focus, actually, on AI, on tech. We'll understand how chief executives are spending. Are you optimistic about the next 12 months? Yes. So, Francine, look, I think, uh, again, it's great to be back over here and to speak to you just in advance of uh, Davos again. Uh, clearly, the past uh, you know, 12 months have seen a lot of volatility and turmoil. Mm -hmm. Uh, but long run, I think we are very optimistic, right? The way in which uh, technology is transforming the world, uh, the promise of AI and what it can do to, you know, multiple industries, uh, the coming together of the digital and the physical worlds. Uh, there's just so much happening that it's hard uh, not to be uh, optimistic about the long-term prospects for our industry and for, uh, you know, enterprises in general. So uh, what does it mean on how you actually it changes your company, how AI changes your company? Does it, you know, does it change the way people are spending, what products you're offering? Sure. Or, and actually, how do you defend from, from fakes? Sure. So I think, look, what AI really does is that it is uh, transforming entire industries, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the first thing that we're doing is that we're looking at all of the offerings that we have. Uh, let's say that we have an offering in, uh, you know, for our telecom clients. Uh, around uh, how we make their networks more autonomous and more effective. We are now e able to use AI to really reduce the power consumption of the networks, uh, to make the networks more uh, self-healing, for instance. So it is how do we infuse AI into each and every single service line that we have, and how do we use it to transform entire industries? Uh, from our own perspective, obviously, it has meant a huge amount of training, right? So, you know, over 30,000 people, for instance, trained in uh, pair programming, uh, it has meant looking at our own processes and seeing how we can use AI to make these a lot more uh, efficient. Yeah. Uh, it, is, it is a lot of things, right? Yeah. So the, what we're yeah. trying to do yeah. is to get away from point solutions because they're clearly ways in which AI will transform the contact center. What we're trying to do with our customers is to have a view on how AI will transform entire industries. Yeah, but can you give us a glimpse of, of how you think they'll transform? Because again, it's sure. so large that yes. it, it's actually it probably changes everything we'll do in the future. Yeah. But is does it will it come quicker than we think, or will it be slower? And can you give me a concrete example? Sure, sure, sure. So I'll give you a couple of very interesting examples, right? So for one, we're working with an auction house, and if you uh, know auction house and art dealers, for instance, uh, there are often a lot of uh, damaged artwork or damaged paintings. Uh, now, how do you envisage or imagine what the artwork will look like mm -hmm. when it's restored? And I thought this was just a phenomenal use case of AI being able to fill in the gaps mm -hmm. uh, in the artwork of imagining what a restored artwork would look like. Uh, there's another very interesting example that we did uh, with a very large furniture retailer. Mm -hmm. And in the uh, sort of the aftermath of the Barbie movie, they wanted to take their entire catalog and turn it pink. Now, if you can imagine taking a catalog and turning it pink would have meant sort of designers working over weeks and weeks, right? Now, in this case, we were able to use Gen AI and be able to transform their entire catalog into pink uh, almost overnight, right? So I think these are just two sort of interesting yeah. examples of yeah. uh, the use of uh, AI. But if I look at it more systematically, if I look at the telecom business, for instance, which is a very significant portion of our, uh, you know, of our business, um, whether it is from a contact center perspective or from a network perspective or from a product management perspective, uh, what can AI do for the various parts of the business? Yeah. And so therefore, what is the level of, uh, you know, of automation, productivity, mm -hmm. improved customer service that you can drive? We're coming up with a very comprehensive point of view for each industry, mm -hmm. for telecom, for manufacturing, for financial services, for healthcare. Mm -hmm. And again, you and asked about the speed. Yeah. And, and my sense is, look, again, like every technology, right, uh, it will be slow to take off, yeah. but ultimately prove to be a lot more transformational in the long run than we can imagine now. Uh, amongst your clients, who do you think will spend more in 2024 in terms of industry groups? I know some of the carriers are struggling. Yeah. Some of healthcare is doing quite well. Can you, do yeah. you already have a good idea of, of who's in a better shape? Well, it, it, it's hard to say just now. And again, we do have a very uh, robust and global client base. On the whole, the American clients seem to have held on better than, uh, you know, than the mm -hmm. rest of the world. Uh, we do see manufacturing uh, as a sector that has continued to uh, power through the uh, slowdown. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that uh, banking and financial services, which is a billion dollar plus industry for us, uh, will come back uh, you know, this year. So that's how we see the world. And again, for telecom players, right? I feel that the opportunity for them to reinvent themselves, to get more closer to the customer, yeah. to drive revenue growth is, is absolutely there. Yeah. And I do see 
you know, again, sort of early seeds of optimism in that industry. Yeah, but are, are there spending pressures? And again, what does it mean for the medium term, I guess, outlook for revenue? Yeah. So look, I mean, we're in a silent period just yes. now. We announced our yeah. results uh, later this, uh, this month. Uh, but on the whole, I do feel that, uh, you know, uh, given how the global economy is shaping up, yeah. Uh, you know, the bottom didn't fall out of the economy last year. And we're hopeful that by the second half of the year, we should see uh, an uptake mm -hmm. in spend. And that is what all the, uh, you know, all the analyst firms are calling for as well. And anecdotally, in conversations with our clients, again, January is going to be very important, right? Because January is typically when, uh, you know, the bottom falls out of the market. Mm -hmm. And if we can hold on to this optimism uh, towards the end of the month, I feel we're set for a better year. Yeah. Uh, is it, do you think it's real optimism, or is it mainly because 2020, 2023 was a funny year? Yeah. I know this is not like CFA level five, but yeah. we were expecting it to, to be yes. a terrible year. And yes. every three months it was, look, it's, we're going to see a recession. We never saw it materialize. Mm. So, again, how much of this optimism is compared to last year, and how much of it is actually seeing green shoots? Yeah. But my own sense is that, look, you know, uh, the pessimistic position always sounds more intellectually robust and sound, right? <laughs> and the optimistic position always sounds a little bit uh, sort of uh, uh, somebody trying to push an agenda or somebody trying to sell something. Uh, but I do feel that in, in the long run, uh, you know, enterprises need to spend on technology. Uh, many of them have already lost the year by cutting back discretionary spending fairly significantly. Yeah. Uh, I do feel that if uh, the economies grow even at the lower end of what has been forecast, uh, we should see a better year than 2023. I know a lot of the risks out there, again, are misinformation, fake news, things like yeah. that. Is there anything that, that you're focused on as, as we're also in an election cycle, frankly, across the world for this yeah. year? Yeah. So, look, I think we're always very mindful of the fact that we have 150,000 employees across the world. We do business in over 50 countries. Uh, I think the best sort of inoculation for a company from a cybersecurity perspective, apart from obviously technology, is the culture, right? We want to make sure that our people understand the risks that are there and that they are very uh, mindful and thoughtful mm -hmm. in uh, how we build technology for our clients and make sure that we keep them yeah. secure at all times. What are you most looking forward to at, at the World Economic Forum? It's amazing. I, I know, you know a lot of times people say, look, it's just for the elites, and it yeah. never gets done. But it's amazing how many people are going and, and the fact that it, it, at least it's a good forum for people to talk, get together and maybe yeah. do business. Yeah. So, look, I think, you know, we were just talking before this. This is going to be my 10th time at uh, the World Economic Forum. And for me, it, it's always incredible what a great turnout there is. Uh, but more importantly, the fact that people are open, right? And sometimes you catch early trends in uh, uh, Davos. So, for instance, you know, uh, people in Davos have been talking about AI for the past four or five years. Uh, well before it became mainstream. So I'm actually very keen to know, uh, you know, w will a lot of the discussion be around, for instance, bioengineering or will it be around, uh, you know, uh, space technology? So you always carry, uh, catch some of the early trends in Davos. Uh, and again, looking forward to meeting with clients, meeting with old friends and, uh, you know, coming back uh, uh, with, uh, with a new set of ideas to take forward into 2024. Mohit Joshi, thank you so much for joining us. That was the chief executive at Tech Mahindra. We'll have plenty more on Bloomberg. This is The Pulse. Now, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is meeting the Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas in Ramallah today. Yesterday, Blinken said Israel must stop undercutting Palestinian governments and rein in settler violence. Now, it's some of his most direct criticism of the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government since the start of the war with Hamas. Israel has largely ignored growing calls to scale back the intensity of its campaign in Gaza and is pushing ahead with its plan to target Hamas leaders. Meanwhile, the UK Foreign Secretary David Cameron says he's worried that Israel may have broken international law in Gaza. Well, Hamas-run health ministry officials in the Palestinian territory say over 23,000 people have been killed since October 7th. Cameron said he regularly consults government lawyers over incidents in the war, but refused to say whether Israel has acted illegally. Am I worried that Israel have ta has taken action that might be in breach of international law because this particular premises has been bombed or whatever? Yes, of course I'm worried about that, and that's why I consult the Foreign Office lawyers when giving this advice on arms exports. So that's why I don't... So you're, if you put it that way, I'm happy to say, yes, of course, 
every day I look at what's happened and ask questions about is this in line with international humanitarian law, could the Israelis have done better to avoid civilian casualties? Of course I do that. And Houthi rebels have carried out one of their largest missile and drone attacks to date on commercial shipping lanes in the Red Sea. The move has prompted a response from U.S. and U.K. warships patrolling the region critical to global trade. Now, they shot down 18 drones, two anti-ship cruise missiles, and an anti-ship ballistic missile. And the World Economic Forum releases its global risk report in just a few minutes, and we'll hear from Sadia Zahidi, the WEF managing director. That conversation is up shortly, and this is Bloomberg. Bitcoin steadies after a fake post saying the SEC had approved ETS of the digital asset. Now an actual decision is expected later today. Houthi rebels carry out one of their largest drone and missile attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea, prompting action from U.S. and U.K. warships in the critical sea route. Plus, sales at the world's largest chip manufacturer, TSMC, fell 8% in December, but revenue for the quarter was actually better than expected. Now, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. A new report from the World Economic Forum has given a gloomy outlook on the risks facing the world in the coming years. The release of the Global Risk Report comes before leaders from government and business gather in Davos next week. Now, I spoke to Sadia Sahidi, the WEF's managing director, about the findings. In the two-year time frame, um, mis- and disinformation, number one risk. So we put together the views of 1,500 experts, and that's what they're most wor worried about, very closely followed by extreme weather, societal polarization, inflation. These are some of the topics that are top of mind. But 10 years out, four top risks all about the environment, including, for the first time, um, crossing tipping points for the Earth's systems. That's something that is top of mind, and I think the predictions that that could happen in 10 years and how severe that could be, deeply concerning. Uh, disinformation, fake news is extremely worrying in an election year. We mm. have a, a large percentage of world GDP actually going to the polls this year. How worried are you about the US election? I mean, depending on how you count it, major economies with large populations, India, the US, um, are going into these elections. And what we found is that at each country level, in addition to the global risk around mis- and disinformation, it's usually ranked very high among the top five risks around the world, as is concerns about an economic downturn. So what we're thinking is when these two things come together, the economic hardship being faced by many people and the rise of synthetic content combined with going into an election year where people get to make decisions about who's going to be leading them, that together can be a very potent mix. And in particular, if some of those views start spilling over into very different perceptions of reality when it comes to health, when it comes to what people are thinking about education, what people think about specific people, who then becomes the owner of the truth. Yeah, and again, it, do you have a breakdown of actually this misinformation? Is it state actors? I know Russia has been involved in the past in U.S. elections. So we're seeing a concern that this could be become much more pervasive. To some extent, it's almost easier to track some of that state-sponsored disinformation and misinformation. But now, at some point, that starts spilling over, and it becomes very difficult to track, especially without tracking systems, watermarking systems, and especially without the public being well-educated about the risks of synthetic content, and especially when that is fake news. Does that have a clear impact on the economy, as I guess chief executives don't want to spend because they don't know what pans out in the next 12 months? So there's a lot of economic uncertainty. Um, we're seeing uh, a risk of the lack of economic opportunity. We're seeing inflation in the top 10. We're seeing a lot of concerns around what exactly happens. And that's because of two different um, situations. One is, of course, there continues to be uncertainty as to what the policy outlook will be. Yes, we are starting to tend towards a softer landing. But at the same time, I think there are new pressures coming in, supply side pressures that are coming in. There's geopolitical 
ethical risks um, out there, and that may change what happens over the course of the coming year. And then there's a longer term economic risk, and that has a lot more to do with the divergence between developed and developing economies, and that also has a lot to do with the divergence between um, high income people and low income people across all countries. And that divergence combined with the existing social polarization together can then create additional economic uncertainty. This is a very gloomy outlook for 2024. Is it even more gloomy than what we had last year, where we thought that higher interest rates could actually crush economies and companies? Last year, we had two sets of extremes. So we had people that were in a very negative camp, in a very positive camp, but over time, those two extremes were converging, and their outlook for the 10 years was much more positive. This year, it's deeply concerning. We have about 60% of people that already believe that we're on the precipice of some form of catastrophic risk, and that is going to increase even more in the 10-year time frame. Sorry, from 30% to 60% when it comes to catastrophic risk over the next 10 years. So that means that the outlook has shifted deeply towards a darker side over the next 10 years. I know a lot of you know, people that read this report and saying it means I need to take more action. Is there a real danger that because there's a difference between the shorter term risk, which is misinformation, the longer term risk, climate change, and you know, the, the shifting of the world, that they don't take the longer term actions? I'm talking about chief executives and world leaders. Absolutely. So this is the one of the greatest concerns coming out. What is the space for action? Because we're looking at currently a very complex picture, a lot of here and now crises. We're looking at some of those crises becoming deeper over the next two years. And then 10 years out, we've got a completely different set of crises. So for example, something like the adverse impact of artificial intelligence, a very low risk at the present time in the two year time frame, it's down the 26th spot. It jumps up into the top 10 over the course of the 10 years. Are we prepared in enough about things like climate, about the adverse impact of new technologies over the 10 year time frame. Are we taking those actions now? And I think that's something that the responders are very concerned about. And, and Salia, how, how much of it, is it also fear of the unknown? So you actually, you don't know the outcome of elections. You don't know exactly how much misinformation there is out there. And you certainly don't know what AI ends up being. Some of this is about uh, the that lack of um, certainty around what's coming up, but I think it's also about that overall structural shift that's taking place. So we know that Earth systems are changing because of climate change. We know that geopolitical structures are changing. We know that the underlying forces of the economy are starting to change and societies are starting to become more fragmented. And at the same time, we know that technology is moving forward at a pace that is completely unprecedented. And this year, that's the background we used, that everybody is now aware of some of these structural shifts that are taking place. And in the midst of that, to have additional shocks and to have decision-making structures which are maybe not quite ready to handle this level of change, that together is what's creating this outlook. That was uh, Sadia Zahidi, Managing Director at the World Economic Forum, speaking to us a short time ago about the latest Global Risks report. Now, coming up, we'll be hearing from the chief executive of NASPERS, Africa's most valuable company. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. <laughs> Welcome back. So the sell-off in Chinese tech stocks continues with Tencent closing down nearly 2% today. It's the fifth consecutive day of losses and Tencent's longest losing streak since September. Now the move will be a concern at NASPERS, Africa's most valuable listed company, which has been selling off its stake, but it still owns more than a quarter of Tencent. Well, Bloomberg's Jennifer Zabazaja is in Joburg with an exclusive interview for us. Hi, Jen. Yeah. Hi, Fran. Good morning to you. I, I do. I'm very pleased to have Puti Mahanyela de Bengua, the NASPERS SA CEO, joining us here in studio. Puti, thanks so much for being here. So Fran was just talking uh, for a few minutes uh, about Tencent uh, down slightly. Uh, I know Tencent is slightly uh, different than uh, what it is that you manage. But when we talk about the investors here in South Africa and the jo Johannesburg Stock Exchange, uh, is there a concern uh, right now about where tech is heading? So thank you very much, Jen. It's great to be here. I think when you look at the tech industry and you see the difficulties that we have been through in the last few years, um, you see just the, you know, the opportunities that we see. Certainly when we look at our businesses um, in NASPERS and Process, 
um, we're very much looking forward to you know seeing the the, the growth uh, that that we see within our businesses. Um, I won't speak to uh, results since those will be coming out soon, but it really is a very positive trajectory that we're on. Um, and I think certainly generally throughout the tech industry, um, we'll be seeing more of, of a positive trajectory. And that's notwithstanding the difficulties that we as, you know, have seen on behalf of our consumers in terms of, you know, the economic environment that consumers have been operating in. And also the regulatory environment, the impact that that has had also on the industry. And so, you know, there, there's been a number of issues impacting um, on the industry, as has many other industries being impacted. But notwithstanding that, we remain very positive. Does that, I, I know uh, you were recently in India because you and uh, your team have a lot of investments there. Does that potentially then impact you replicating any sort of success here in South Africa because of all the headwinds and the challenges? I mean, how are you looking at it? Not, not necessarily. So we're a business that invests in entrepreneurs in those particular environments. Mm. And so from that perspective, it's about backing those um, entrepreneurs. And so we, 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 we are impacted to a certain extent by some of the global headwinds. Mm. However, you know, it's largely about driving and focusing on the work of those particular um, entrepreneurs. Um, and so when I look at the businesses that we have here in South Africa, um, I'm, I'm very, very confident about the businesses that we have here, looking at the Take A Lot group, um, looking at many of our classified businesses that are based here in South Africa, um, even our media business. Um, and so it, it, it really is good just to see that we're focused on a very positive trajectory where we are really focused on ensuring that we have profitable businesses for our investors. And so, yeah. Are they, are they profitable here in South Africa right now? We, we are working towards ensuring that all our businesses become profitable. And, yeah. and We're on that trajectory. And, and you mentioned Take A Lot, so I want to go there yeah. because for people who don't know, Take A Lot, Take -A -Lot is the biggest e-commerce platform here in South Africa. Correct. And there's a lot of talk about Amazon, right? Amazon is finally imminently going to be entering into the South African space. Yeah. How do you retain that market share uh, with Take A Lot considering the behemoth that Amazon is coming into this market? Yeah. So, so I think it's, it's, it's good for South Africa that an Amazon is attracted to coming into the market. Mm. Um, we, as, as a business, have seen that Amazon has been successful in some markets, but has not been successful in all markets. And so, you know, as Take A Lot, the Take A Lot group, I think we're very well positioned. Um, we know our market very, very well. We have been in this market. Take A Lot has been in the environment for 12 years now. Mm. Um, and so, you know, they're very well entrenched. Um, looking at the different categories of Take A Lot, whether it's takealot.com or Mr. D or Superbalist, our fashion business, you know, we, we have businesses that are well entrenched in the market. And so we feel confident um, about the business continuing to scale and being a profitable business, notwithstanding the entrance of Amazon. Does it present, though, the fiercest competition that you've maybe seen yet in this, in this market? It does, yes. And so that doesn't concern you at it all? It does concern yeah. us, and that is why we are ensuring that our business is well equipped. We are investing more into our business. We are ensuring that we're well positioned to be able to deal with having our environment, having um, a big player like an Amazon. What does well position look like? Can you just dig into that a little bit more? So we're investing a lot more into our businesses. So as an example, if I look at our, distribu our DCs, our distribution uh, centers, um, we're ensuring that we have access to, um, to, to all the distribution centers that we require. Um, we are ensuring that we are, we, we've looked through the entire uh, route to market and ensuring that we are well positioned towards being able to, to deal with, you know, whatever um, could be coming from, from Amazon. Well, and there's a lot of, when we just think about, uh, you know, you were alluding to the uncertainty. A lot of people talk about 2024 being an uncertain year because of a number of things that are happening. How do you, how do you navigate that? I mean, how do you set up for that given there's also an election happening here in South Africa? I mean, how is the business positioning itself here? Well, the reality is that things are never really you know, to certain. Um, things are constantly changing. Um, and in our environment, we find that there's constant changes, where, whether it be the war in Ukraine and the impact on that with respect to the commodities that we have to import into South Africa. Mm. Um, you know, so, so there's constant challenges that, that, that we face. Uh, this is another significant uh, challenge, but we've been preparing for a number this of years. This by what? 
What do you, when you say this? I, I'm talking about the entrance of an Amazon, an Amazon. into the market. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes. We, and we have been preparing for a number of years. What do you see as the next challenge then on the horizon for 2024? I think the next challenge on the horizon for us is to ensure that our business is well positioned in terms of ensuring that we have the best routes, we are well priced, we have uh, good people and all of that. And this is something that we have been investing in now for a number of years. And I think we were well prepared. Are you considering adjusting pricing then, considering the other entrants that are in to stay competitively, uh, the competitive advantage? We, we are constantly looking at pricing um, to the advantage of our consumers. And so that is something that we have continuously been doing in any case. And I just want to finish on the fact that, uh, you know, we started off with Tencent. There's Naspers, there's Process. I think anybody who knows these companies knows about the complex uh, cross-holding structure. Uh, have some of the deals, have some of the unwinding that we've been seeing over the past few months, have they sort of helped with the discounts uh, throughout the company? I mean, are, is there more to come? Do you think that, you know, your interim CEO, Irvin Tu, is, is looking in, into more? Well, actually, Irvin Tu was very much a part of the team that was looking at the cross-holding and working at ensuring that we have that, you know, the, the removal of the cross-holding um, taking place. And so um, that is something that, that has been key for us. We have seen, you know, the appreciation of our share price, of process um, and NASPERS as a result um, of, of, you know, the removal of, of the cross-holding. But, you know, we, we operate in a volatile environment. Mm. So it could be another impact in another geography. Um, and so our share price is, is a difficult measure for us to use as an indication of our success. Mm. Um, but what I'm happy about is the fact that the underlying business and in terms of the undertakings that we've made to investors, that our e-commerce portfolio would be profitable, we are very much on track towards achieving that. And so, you know, that is something that, you know, is, is, is important for us um, and which we have full control over. So then do you think when people are taking a look at the share price and the ups and the downs. We saw Naspers and Process uh, over the past few days sort of dip a little bit. Uh, you're saying they shouldn't necessarily look too much into that and look at other, other indications? Absolutely. I'm saying that over the long term, mm -hmm. we are, we've been listed um, in, on, on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange for many, many decades mm -hmm. now. And one of the um, biggest weighted companies. Absolutely, yeah. we are. Um, Process is the second largest uh, listed company on, 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 on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And so, you know, we, you know we, we're very much aware of the impacts of the market. And the reality is that there's a number of external issues that will impact on the share price uh, because of the fact that we are in 100 geographies across the world. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is that, you know, what we are focused on is ensuring that we have a profitable business. That is what we have undertaken to our investors, and that is what is we are focused on, and, and we're delivering on that. And so, um, you know, we, we remain very positive towards, you know, having a business that um, our investors continue to be very happy about. Potentially expansion in 2024? Or there's always opportunities <laughs> for expansion. I mean, our ventures team is continuously looking for opportunities. And so there's a number of, uh, of opportunities that we continue to look at. Even on the African continent? Even on the African continent, we look at different okay. opportunities, yeah. All right, All right. we yeah. have to leave it there. Uh, thank you, Puti, sure. uh, for being with us. That is Puti Mahaniela de Bengua, uh, the NASPERS South Africa CEO, joining me here in studio. Fran? What a great interview. Thank you so much. Jennifer Zabazaja there speaking to the NASPERS, as she was saying, South Africa executive. Now, the world's largest contract chip maker, TSMC, says sales fell over 8% in December. Overall, fourth quarter revenue beat estimates with demand for AI processors offsetting sluggish smartphone and laptop chip sales. Now to France, which has its youngest ever and first openly gay prime minister. 34-year-old Gabriel Attal rose to prominence as the government spokesperson and then education minister. Now his predecessor, Elisabeth Borne, resigned on Monday following political turmoil over immigration law. Now Macron will work with Attal to name a new government in the coming days. We'll have plenty more, of course, on all of this and more world news coming up shortly. This is Bloomberg.
Polish police have arrested former Interior Minister Mariusz Kamiński and his deputy who were holed up at the presidential palace in contravention of a court order to send the men to prison for abuse of power. Now let's go straight to Bloomberg's Warsaw Bureau Chief Piotr Skolimowski for more. Piotr, this is a pretty incredible story. Can you just give us a little bit more detail of what exactly happened? Yes, it is. Uh, quite bizarre, to be uh, honest. Um, what, what exactly happened is um, yesterday, um, we've seen for, for a couple of days the situation was that these two um, former officials, I mean, or the officials of the former uh, ruling party, um, were were actually um, were convicted by the by the court in Warsaw um, for the abuse of power um, uh, over a situation or a sting operation that actually happened way back in, in, in late 2000. Uh, and what happened is that even though the, the, the court order was, was issued and they were was issued to arrest them, they were still um, at large and the police actually showed up at their homes yesterday um, to, uh, to take them to prison. In, in the meantime, what happened was that these two gentlemen were already at the presidential palace taking a photo up with the president and um, later were told by the president they can stay, stay at the at the palace. Um, and when the president wasn't there, um, he was meeting with with officials outside the palace. The police moved in and actually arrested them. So, what, what's what's going on? It's is is obviously it's quite bizarre. But but what it tells us, or, or the story actually illustrates, is that this is a situation where we have uh, a new government that that just is in power for. For less than a month right now, the, the, the government of, uh, of former European Council President Donald Tusk, and this government was elected on this ticket of reversing judicial changes of the former national, nationalist um, administration, and they want to make peace with the EU and, and unblock EU funds. In the meantime, the former ruling party and, and the president, who is an ally of the former ruling party, is, is pushing back. And we are we are seeing an escalation, and this is this is one of the key or, or clear demonstrations of the escalation. Although we've already seen earlier that the government also moved in to to put a state broadcaster into liquidation because uh, the state broadcaster was accused of being a a mouthpiece of the of the former ruling party. So it's 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 a very confusing situation at this point, and we are now waiting for the president to weigh in. He's going to talk in about half an hour. And give his take on the on the, on the situation. Piotr, thank you so much. And we'll, we'll keep on, of course, going back to you for updates throughout the day. And you can also follow everything that Piotr and his team write on the Bloomberg terminal. Our Warsaw bureau chief there, Piotr Skolimowski. Now, let's also have a look at Bitcoin. Yesterday was another incredible story, with the, the SEC saying that their account was hacked. At the time, uh, the, the fake account or the fake tweet uh, said that actually they had approved this Bitcoin ETF. We do expect a decision, a real decision, later today, uh, possibly tomorrow. But uh, yesterday certainly sent shockwaves across the world. You can see Bitcoin for the moment, 45,665. Up next, Bloomberg Brief, Danny Berger in London, Manus Kranny in New York, and this is Bloomberg.